Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In this Scribblecast lecture, we're continuing our look at lipids. At the end of the last Scribblecast lecture, we introduced the first class of lipids, the neutral acyl glycerol. This represented our first class of lipid. We pointed out that this was based on the chemistry of alcohols reacting with carboxylic acids in acid to produce esters. We pointed out that a fatty acid can combine with a molecule glycerol to produce a molecule which has one of these three names shown below, tristyrol glycerol, tristyrin or glycerol tristyrate. Now, the point that should be made based on this reaction is that we don't need three equivalents of the fatty acid. If only one molecule fatty acid added to the glycerol, you'd get one ester unit and you'd have two alcohol units. If that actually happened, you would produce what is called a monoacyl glycerol or monoacyl glyceride. If two equivalents of fatty acid are added, you get a diacyl glycerol or diacyl glyceride. And lastly, in this case, tristyrol glycerol is an example of a triacyl glycerol or triacyl glyceride. The last point to note that is if different fatty acids are used, the fatty acid is produced in the L configuration because this carbon right here would become chiral. Now, mono and diacyl glycerols are found in nature, but in much smaller amounts than the triacyl glycerols or the triglycerides. These are naturally occurring esters of long chain carboxylic acids and glycerols, sometimes referred to as glycerides or triglycerides. They represent the most abundant family of lipids, and they have three basic functions. The first is they form the fat depots. the fat depots in organisms. These are the primary storage reservoirs of lipid material. Storage of lipid material. In animal cells, the fat depots represent major energy reserves. Major energy reserves. Now, in the form of lipoproteins called chylomicrons, chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are lipoprotein particles. Remember, lipoprotein just means a combination of a fat, and proteins are groups of amino acids polymerized together. So chylomicrons are lipoprotein, a combination of fat and amino acids, lipoprotein particles. And these chylomicrons are the means by which ingested fatty acids
are transported okay. via the lymphatic system. And blood for distribution within the animal body. So let's just say throughout the body. Okay, the last function is sometimes considered less important, but in fact it's very important. Fat molecules provide physical protection, shock absorption if you like. for the various body organs in animals. It also provides thermal insulation. Allowing warm-blooded animals to have better regulation of body temperature as well as cold-blooded animals. Thermal insulation except in cold-blooded animals, they would use the sun or shady areas to heat up or cool down. An acylglycerol does not contain any ionic functional group, so it's said to be a neutral fat or a neutral oil. And neutral fats typically Call to fat if you are a solid triacylglyceride. And you called an oil if you're liquid. Now, given these three functionalities, one might ask the question, based on our studies of carbohydrates and amino acids, why are triacylglycerols the main energy reserves and not glycogen? The reason for this has to do with efficiency. Triglycerides when compared to carbohydrate give you nearly twice the energy per unit mass. That is, triglycerides will give you approximately 39.7 kilojoules per mole. fat. Whereas with a carbohydrate you only get about 17.6 kilojoules per mole. Hence, and we're going to look at this again and compare it to with the amino acid value, just so you know protein, and uh, it's um, 
put protein up here just for comparison If you were to also compare it to protein, say, well, why not store energy in form of protein? Find out protein is very similar to carbohydrate, giving you only about 18.4 kilojoules. And, ah, uh, sorry about that, it's not per mole, it's per gram. Now, if you look at this value, the, the value of these numbers, you quickly begin to realize that to have the same amount of energy stored in the form of carbohydrate or protein, you'd have to have twice the mass. That makes the animal twice as heavy, and hence the energy is stored less efficiently. Thus, the most efficient form of storing energy in the animal is the triglyceride. Okay. Uh, now, oils contain what, are, what is the difference between a fat and an oil? If I was to take a look at a fat, and just draw a fat. A fat consists of an OC double bond O unit. OC double bond O. And then it is totally saturated. So this is carbon one, Two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So here is an eighteen carbon chain. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Another one. Two, four, six. another one. And you'll notice in the fat how the zigzag pattern of carbons align really well. And if this was, this was brought in close proximity to uh, two fat molecules, you'll say this is one with the three zigzags in it, okay, you end up with almost two linear cigar-shaped molecules approaching each other. This leads to optimum van der Waals forces of interactions. These optimum forces of interactions lead to stronger intermolecular forces, larger surface area contact, and hence, at lower temperatures, the molecules retain solid. Oils, however, remember, are liquid. Oils contain unsaturated positions, double bonds. Now, when you have a double bond in a chain, the double bond can occur in two forms. If the double bond occurs in this pattern, you have this bond, and this bond pointing opposite in a way around the double bond. Remember, that's called the trans configuration. If, however, you have the double bond like this, where the two bonds are on the same side of the double bond. This is called the cis configuration. Now, natural occurring oils have the double bond in the cis configuration. What does this do to our fat or oil molecule? Well, essentially, we still have a triacylglycerol, except we have some of these unsaturated fatty acids in. And so we have a CH2 O 
C double bond O C H O C double bond O and C H two O C double bond O. Now let's put it in, and if I look back at my fatty acids and pick one with a simple double bond in it, okay, um, I have a fat, uh, let's use a shorter carbon chain, okay, palmitic has 16 carbons, palmitic oleic has a double bond to carbon 9. So if I go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'm gonna put a double bond here. Ten. There's a cis configure. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. The chain kinks. Now if this guy has a standard saturated fatty acid. So there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And now let's give this one at carbon 9. Okay. Let's give it a couple if we could. What's a good one with two double bonds? Here's one at 9 and 12, linoleic. So if I go um, 1, Okay, and I can actually start this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, double bond. 10, 11, 12, double bond. That's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17, 18. There's linoleic. Poor drawing. Notice how the molecules kinks. Make the molecule occupy more space. If I was to compare two molecules of this oil coming together, it would look something like this. With a big juxtaposition here, here, and here. It looked something like that, the surface electron density cloud map. And you notice it's not a nice cigar shape. In other words, when it comes in close proximity, these projections, if you like, well, this projection here and this projection here prevent close approach of the bulk of the molecule. And that means the surface area contact is reduced. The amount of surface area here with the amount of surface area here is much less than the surface area here. And Van der Waals, strength of Van der Waals interactions is controlled by two things, distance and the amount of electron cloud surface area that comes in close proximity. Hence, because of these kinks produced in the molecular chain, a oil, a naturally occurring oil, which has unsaturated double bonds in it, gets poorer van der Waals interactions and hence melts easier and stays liquid at higher temperatures. Okay. All right, so remember, the bent chains get in the way of the intermolecular forces of attraction and prevent close approach of oil molecules. Hence, greater separation produces weaker van der Waals forces. Now, oils can be changed to a fat by hydrogenation, by adding hydrogen. The word margarine comes from argaric acid. Now, if oils are liquid, what's often done, and fats, see, uh, many oils are liquid even in a refrigerator, at lower temperatures of a refrigerator. Many fats are rock-hard solid. Uh, the ideal was a spreadable material 
at refrigerated temperatures so the material would not rot easily. It would stay preserved and last longer. To do this, it would often take on oil and hydrogenate it and produce margarine. Okay. The word margarine comes from margaric acid, which is obtained from lichens. Now, one of the problems with this is that you wouldn't hydrogenate all the double bonds. You'd want some balance of double bonds so you're not totally a fat but not totally an oil. You're some intermediate state. That's what you get with margarine. And so the hydrogenation process would add hydrogen and take out some of the kinks. But sometimes the cis double bond would convert to a trans double bond. Okay? And if it did, you notice it gets that linear format just like a chain, giving produce, producing strong interactions. Now this could result in a bad situation in which the material would precipitate out as readily as a saturated fat, and sometimes more readily. So hydrogenation process were found to be producing what are called trans fats. Now you'll notice trans fats labeled are not foodstuffs. And the reason for this is trans fats are thought, like fats, to contribute to a disease known as atherosclerosis, or the formation of solid deposits on the walls of blood vessels, which restrict the flow of blood, causing disease of the heart and arteries. Now it's a little more com complicated. It's not just these fats. It's these fats in conjunction with proteins and uh, interactions of cholesterol, blood, fat, and blood protein. And these molecular interactions produce two types of lipoproteins, high density and low density. It turns out that these trans fats were found to contribute to the presence of low density lipoproteins, and so hydrogenating to produce margarines that had trans fats was considered even worse than consumption of fats. Polyunsaturates, on the other hand, with the true cis configuration, were thought to reduce this precipitation process. Connection between cholesterol and fat and the onset of atherosclerosis is an area of intensive research, and we're going to talk more about this when we come to the molecule cholesterol. Now, most glycerides in animals are fats. Most, okay, so let's just jot this down. Glycerides in animals tend to be in the form of fats. But in plants, they tend to be in the form of oils. So you often hear the term co coined animal fat, like bacon fat, beef fat, etc. Whereas with plants such as vegetables, you hear the terms vegetable oils, corn oil, sunflower oil, that type of thing. Okay. Now, these glycerides have one very interesting feature that we need to discuss, and that is their reaction Their reaction with base. So let's draw this. A tristerin molecule. And reacted with three sodium hydroxides. 
Well, if we do this reaction, base is known to hydrolyze uh, ester functional groups. So it will give us back our alcohol. Base, hydroxide, is not basic enough to deprotonate an alcohol. So we get a fully protonated glycerol molecule. However, hydroxide being a base will result in the cleavage of the ester and forming free fatty acid. But acid is carboxylic acid, and carboxylic acid, in the presence of base, deprotonates. So we get CH3. CH216, so the carboxylic acid is deprotonated, and our stearic acid, if we have, let's say the counter ion is sodium, becomes a sodium stearate. Now, sodium stearate is two words has some very interesting properties. You see, this molecule does not know whether it wants to dissolve in water or not. Let's think about this. We have 18 carbons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. On the one hand, the CO2 minus unit is very polar. And polar groups interact with hydrogen bonding, polar water molecules, very well. On the other hand, it has this long hydrophobic tail, nonpolar tail, which is water repelling. It doesn't interact with water molecules very well at all. It's organic and nonpolar. So on the one hand, water molecules would like to interact with this, and on the other hand, it doesn't want to interact with the tail. So does this molecule dissolve, or doesn't it? Well, I can represent this molecule with a squiggle. That's a bad squiggle. Let's see if I can. Let's draw a circle for the CO2 minus, and then a squiggle. Oh, that's just as bad. Now, the circle is the polar head of the molecule and wants to dissolve. The tail doesn't. So what happens? Instead of dissolving as individual molecules, groups or clusters of 50 to 150 soap molecules will aggregate into a sphere. What's that mean? Well, we actually get a sphere of these molecules. Now I'm making less than 50 or 150, but you get the idea. The heads of our molecules are on the outside of the sphere. And the tails point to the inside of the sphere and interact with each other through intermolecular forces. This sphere is called a micelle. Now, in the strict form of the definition of dissolving or solubility, these micelles don't really dissolve. Remember, to dissolve into solution is to split up the intermolecular forces into discrete molecules that are surrounded by solvent molecules. While we're not breaking this up completely, what dissolves is this group of molecules, and so it's not really proper to use the term dissolving. We need a new term. That term is emulsify. If you like, emulsify is the dissolving of a group of molecules. When you have a group surrounded or solvated like this, the micelle gets solvated, water molecules, hydrogen bond to these anionic heads, the hydrogen bond, and so water will dissolve, or better, emulsify the uh, group of mole molecules called a micelle. Now this process 
And these deprotonated fatty acids that form these micelles are called a soap. And the process, this base reaction, is called saponification. Saponification basically means the making of sapon, or, if you like, soap. You see, soaps have a unique property, and that property is to take oils floating on water and dissolve them in the water. If you have an oily pot and you're scrubbing it in water and you let the water stand, you'll see the oils floating on the water. However, if you add some soap and you scrub the pot, you see the soap bubbles, but all the oil seems to have disappeared and dissolved. Why? Well, it turns out these micelles can be broken apart through mechanical action. That is, they can be broken up and come back together. If you're in oily water, the oil is repelled by the water, if you like. That's why it stays a separate layer. But being organic in nature would love to dissolve or interact with the hydrocarbon hydrophobic tails. So when the micelle breaks apart and comes back together, the oil actually gets dissolved into the center of the micelle. The outer micelles emulsified. And so scrubbing of the pot allows the oil to get dissolved in the center of my cell, and because of my cells dissolved in water, emulsified in water, it gets washed away. Since my cells represent an aggregate of molecules dispersed throughout the solvent, the soap is said to have formed an emulsion, a mixture of one liquid dispersed through another liquid. Remember, mechanical action, agitation, or scrubbing is required for a soap to work properly. The breakup okay, of the nonpolar phase and the micelles allows the oils to enter the center of the soap micelle. Now, some problems with soaps are as follows. Only the sodium and potassium cell, uh, salts are soluble of fatty acids, so we have to have sodium and potassium. If we have calcium, iron, or magnesium salts, such as, oh, I guess it would be like this. Oops. Did I miss that? No, I didn't. I don't know. If we have two of these bound to a calcium, then this is a solid precipitate. And it's responsible for many of the soap scum. So if you have hard water supplies, natural occurring soaps can be a problem. To correct this problem, synthetic detergents were developed that do not precipitate in hard water. They have the same features of a soap. They have a polar head and a long nonpolar tail. Let's look at some examples. For example, this molecule. A sulfonate. We've seen sulfonates before in this course. Sulfonates would have a polar head, and the organic chain I've drawn here would give it a nice non polar tail. And this is referred to as sodium paradecal benzene sulfonate.
Paradecobenzene sulfonate is a synthetic detergent. Another type is based on the chemistry we learned in the alcohol section of the course last semester. The production of inorganic esters. Um, this 12 carbon alcohol is referred to as laurel alcohol. That's its common name. If lower alcohol is reacted with H2SO4, cold, remember the H2SO4 is concentrated, and must be kept cold because you don't want side reactions, H2SO4 can actually uh, produce uh, alkenes at higher temperatures. You will produce the hydrogen sulfate. You will produce CH3, CH2, 10 times, CH2OS, double bond O. This is a uh, uh, dodecyl hydrogen sulfate, which if you hit with base, you can deprotonate. If you hit it with sodium hydroxide, you will produce CH3, CH2, 10 times, And sodium plus here. Sodium lauryl sulfate. Again, an ionic polar head followed by a long carbon chain. Now, in order to maintain, bio, maintain the soap's capability for biodegradation, most detergents are prepared with the aromatic ring. Okay. Um, this allows more biodegradable compounds. Highly branched side chains are not bi biodegradable. Now, these synthetic detergents will not precipitate in hard water. That is in calcium, iron, or water that contains magnesium salts. You use synthetic detergents instead of natural uh, deprotonated fatty acid as your soaps. Now the last thing I want to say about soaps is that they belong to a larger class of compounds called surfactants. And surfactants are like soaps in that they possess long hydrocarbon chains, they have polar ionic ends, but they don't necessarily have to be negatively charged. So I want to give you one that you should take a quick look at, and that's all I'm going to say about surfactant chemistry, that is positively charged, and that involves nitrogen. So now we give it a long carbon tail. How about 14? CH2s, straight chain, CH3. And so a quaternary nitrogen is positively charged. 
And that means the counter ion will be something like chloride or some other negatively charged species. And so what we have here is benzyl hexadecyl hexadecane, remember, is 16 carbons. Benzyl hexadecyl dimethyl ammonium and then a separate word chloride. Again, this is very similar to soap. The only difference is our anakid is now positively charged and we have this long carbon chain and it would be expected to act similar to a soap okay well i'm dr brian lloyd this is my scribble cast we're going to continue looking at other classes of uh, fatty acid based lipids um, we finished off looking at neutral isoglycerols and got a little sidetracked because of the unique pr property of being able to generate soaps. Soaps, being based on fatty acids, show a unique um, and very important property that uh, we as human society have taken advantage of. Okay, thank you very much.